Andre, a simple question to start. As we enter deliberations, what is in the mind of these jurors? Well, what will be in the mind is the elements of the crime that they'll be charged. Um, for substance of wire fraud, the government will have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Ms. Holmes intentionally deceived investors or patients to obtain their money and that she did so through material statements or omissions. That means statements or omissions that were capable of influencing the investors and patients. That's going to be the focus of the jurors. It's been a really long three-month trial, and yet we packed the conclusion into a single day on Friday, right? We got through the closing arguments from de the defense, the rebuttal. Do the jury remember all the facts of the evidence, the legal principles that have been discussed, or do they go off the theater of the last three months? Well, the jury charges will be fresh in their minds because the judge will just have instructed them. But the scheduling is right. very unusual, a few days before a major holiday. And there, you know, there are a couple of schools of thought on that. Some lawyers think that's a great thing for the prosecutors, that the jurors may want to just get it on, uh, get over uh, with their deliberations, convict, and return to their families. Other lawyers think that um, you know, jurors tend to be more compassionate around this time. They're going to be going back to their families. They'll know Ms. Holmes as a young parent, and they may feel bad for her. OK, so who does that scenario favor? We're five days away from Christmas Eve. It's a Friday. The jury may want this to be done quickly. Is that in Elizabeth Holmes's favor, or is that in the prosecution's favor? You know, it's unclear. Personally, I think these kind of generalizations are overblown. I think the reality is that most jurors take their oaths seriously. They have sacrificed so much of their lives already. They want to get this right. Um, you know, there was a big trial in New York a few years ago, the FIFA case. There were three defendants, um, and it was right around this time, right before the holidays, and the jury got the case just right before the holidays, just like this. They convicted two of the defendants, and then they returned after the holidays, and they acquitted the third. So this just shows you can't generalize. I think it all come down to the evidence, and I think the jury will really try to get this one right. Andre, there was a large body of evidence that suggested or demonstrated even that the Theranos analyzer did not work to the full effect of what Elizabeth Holmes and other Theranos executives said it could do. There's a lot of evidence that suggests Elizabeth Holmes exaggerated at least the capabilities of the machine, but also misled about what the company was doing. At the same time, the defense kind of relied on this idea that Elizabeth Holmes was acting in good faith, right? She really believed in what this company was doing. Wh which argument is more powerful? You know, this is a strong case for the government. At the end of the day, you know, it is a strong case. It's not overwhelming on every element, though. And there are definitely soft spots. And the, and the defense has done a good job of exploiting those um, soft spots. So, you know, first of all, like in most white collar cases, the evidence showing intent, which is what you just touched on, is entirely circumstantial in this case. There's no smoking gun. You know, there's no recording of Holmes saying to someone, I'm going to lie to these investors and I'm going to take their money. That, that doesn't exist in this case. And the government's case also lacks a little bit of emotional appeal. You know, the picture you get from all this evidence is that Holmes was not the sort of traditional fraudster who wanted to steal the investors' money and run. She really seemed to believe in the company and in herself. Um, she never cashed out, even though she could. So that may not matter legally at the end of the day. You can't lie to investors and patients, even if you have the best intentions. But it could matter to jurors. It could raise the, the bar for reasonable doubt. So I think the evidence is strong. This is a strong case for the government. But there is definitely room for reasonable doubt, especially on, on intent. Yeah, Andre, what might be hard for the audience to understand is Holmes faces 11 different counts of fraud, essentially, right? And the jury can find her not guilty of some and guilty of others. H how does that work? How does the jury go through each individual charge and make that decision? And, and what does it matter whether she's guilty of all 11 or just some of them? That's right. So the verdict form actually lists all the 11 counts, and they have to mark guilty or not guilty on each one. Um, and they'll work through the evidence, and they'll deliberate on each count. They could disagree on some counts. Um, there could be uh, a mistrial on some counts. There could be conviction on some counts and acquittal on others. But practically speaking, there isn't a big difference between a conviction on one count and a conviction on all 11. A conviction, either a substantive or a conspiracy wire fraud charge, which is all these charges, would expose Holmes 
to a potential maximum sentence of 20 years. So I think it's safe to say she's not getting all 20 years. That's the potential, just one count. And at sentencing, all her conduct, including conduct for which she was acquitted, could be considered by the judge. Right. Because the standard to prove any disputed fact at sentencing right. is much lower um, than reasonable doubt. So, in other words, if the jury finds the government did not prove beyond re reasonable doubt that Holmes defrauded a particular investor or a patient, the judge, applying a right. lower standard, could easily disagree. So all that matters for the government is a conviction on one count yes. to get to sentencing.